Stanford University. Okay, it's demo time. Lecture eight of Stanford CS 193P, spring of 2021. Talked all about animations in the last lecture. We ended it with a demo of uh, implicit animations, but a much more common case for doing animation is explicit animation. And to show that, I'm going to add a feature to my game, which is a shuffle button. I'm just going to put a down, button down here, shuffles the cards. Right now, our game is really easy because all the matching cards are right next to each other, so I can quickly pick them. But if we had a shuffle button and we rearranged all the cards, then it wouldn't be so easy to match. Now, if we want our view here to have a shuffle button, we're going to need to have an intent down here to do shuffle. So let's add an intent. I'm going to call it shuffle. I'm just going to shuffle the cards. Now, how am I going to do that? I'm going to ask the model to shuffle for me, which means I'm also going to have to go over to my model here and add a mutating funk shuffle and it's just going to shuffle the cards cards that shuffle suppose if we were nice we would also go down here and shuffle our cards when we first create our game that's really going to make this game a lot harder i'm not going to be able to just click on side by side cards to do that so now that we have an intent to do shuffling we can go back to our ui and add a button that does shuffling I'm going to take the time in this demo to go ahead and factor some code out to make this stuff look good. For example, right here, this code, I'm going to factor that entire thing out into its own var, which I'm going to call game body. It's just some view, and it's this thing. Then I'm going to create this shuffle button, which is some view. It's a button called shuffle and this action is just to ask our game to shuffle through these this intent remember this game is our view model and so we're just asking it to do this intent func function shuffle now i can build my main body by creating a v stack with the game body and the shuffle button and let's go ahead and do padding in all directions here to give us some room between the edges of our screen and our game and shuffle button there. While I'm at it doing some rearrangement here, I see some code here that has an opportunity to show you something kind of cool. See so here we have a clear rectangle. It's just to fill the space in our aspect V grid for when a card is not there because it got thrown away, it was matched and not face up, so we threw it away. Another cool way to do this is actually to say color.clear. Color, it can actually behave like a view if it's in the right kind of context to be a view like it is here. And color creates a rectangle essentially filled with its color. And there's a color called clear, which is see-through color. And SwiftUI does this in a few places where it has things like colors that can be used as a view. A good, another good example is path. Remember this path that we created uh, in our shape, we could have done something like move to somewhere, p dot add line to somewhere. And this mechanism of creating a path by just giving it a uh, function to execute and it gives you the path back and you do it. Uh, that's, we could have actually done our shape that way. We didn't, but we could have. And we also can just drop this right in the middle of a view as a view so path can behave like a view and it will draw this you could even then stroke it or fill it or whatever you wanted to do with it so that's another kind of cool feature there all right so that's, that's just a little side aside right there okay so let's take a look at our ui and see this has built us something good let's pick a couple of cards and shuffle Oh, it did. It moved them. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Hey, it's moving them all over the place. Now, of course, this looks kind of ridiculous. It's just they're jumping all over the screen in a kind of a messy way. This is a great place. We really want some animation. We would love these cars to just kind of smoothly animate moving around. And that couldn't be easier, really, Swift UI. This is where we do the shuffle. I'm just going to ask it to do it with animation. So with animation is a function in Swift. It takes one argument, which is a function that 
takes no arguments and returns nothing. You just put the code in here and it will animate everything going on here. So let's see what that looks like. Choose a couple cards and shuffle. Woo! Shuffle. Shuffle. So what's actually happening here when we turn on animation? How is this causing this all to happen? We know that animation, it only animates shapes and view modifiers. So there's not any shapes that are being animated here. These have shapes in them, but the shapes themselves aren't being animated. It's just the positions of all these views are being moved around. And those positions are being set by view modifiers that the aspect V grid and inside of it, the lazy V grid are calling specifically the view modifiers position and frame. We haven't really used position and frame. I'll use frame a little bit later in this demo, but those two view modifiers position and size the views and they're used by container views by lazy v grid to position these so when we say with animation all view modifiers that can be animated are being animated including the ones that lazy v grid is using to position these so that's why these are being beautifully animated like this one other thing to notice about this animation what happens if i tap this shuffle button really quickly see it's it, halfway through the first shuffle it starts doing the second shuffle and that's one really fantastic thing about animation it's just automatically interruptible it'll automatically continue to some new animation as best it can now sometimes it's difficult for it to figure out what to do for example let's slow this animation way down by having it be an ease in out with duration of five seconds open a couple of cards, shuffle. So this is taking five seconds to do this. If I rotate, that's a different animation. You can see that it smoothly transitioned between this animation that was going on and this one. Now some of the cards went off screen because it doesn't want to jerk them around to be back on screen. So it's doing the best it can to try and make the animations smoothly transition between each other. And if we can find a match, so if we can find them out, oh, here we go, the trains. Watch this, when we shuffle, those implicit animations, they just keep on going. They're independent animations, and the fact that we're doing another explicit animation here, no effect on those. So you can see why we wanted these to essentially be implicit animations. We want the spinning to happen, not just when we choose cards, but while we're shuffling everything, it's kind of independent of the explicit animations that we're doing. Now, when do we use explicit animations like this? Well, we almost always use them for intent functions. When you express your intent, it's usually an intent to modify the model. If you're modifying the model because of the reactive nature of our UIs, it's likely something's gonna change here. And when something changes here, it's likely we want it to be animated. That's why calls to intent functions extremely often have with animation wrapped around them. It's not the only thing we might explicitly animate, and it's not always the case that you would animate an intent function, but it's just extremely common. And so when you're writing your code, if you find yourself you're not doing this, you might ask, hmm, why is this intent not animated? Uh, or vice versa, if you're animating things and it's not really intent, and so, hmm, okay, well, it better, better be, it better be some local thing having to do with the view. And we'll actually see that uh, down the road where I'm going to explicitly animate something that's not an intent. It's not affecting the model. It's only affecting the way the view is drawing. Now, this is not the only intent we have. Here's another intent, game choose card right here. And when we choose a card currently, the card just instantly flips up. Oh, got a match. Instantly flips up here or instantly flips back down. So we should be animating this choose as well. This is another intent. Choose is an intent right there. So let's animate that. Ooh, so something changed there. You could see it kind of faded in and it kind of fades out. Now this is not the same as 
flipping the cards over, that would be a different animation, which we're going to do in just a second here. But something definitely did change with the choose. Not just for the card we chose, but for other cards that might be affected. In other words, all changes to the model were animated when we put this width animation around this intent change. Now, in all these cases, this width animation can use the same arguments that we saw down here with this implicit animation, although you'd almost certainly never want to repeat forever on an explicit animation, but you certainly might want to control the duration or decide whether it's linear or the default, which is ease in, ease out. So our next big task here is to make it so that tapping on these cards doesn't just fade them in like that, it flips them over. So I'm going to slow this animation way down too. I'm going to use ease in out and we'll duration of three so that we can really see what's happening when we tap on these cards. They're fading in, fading in, and then fading out while this one fades in. So how are we going to make these flip? All right. What, what does it actually mean to flip? If you think of a card flipping over, it's actually a kind of a 3D effect, right? Card starts there, it kind of tilts up on its edge so that you can't even see the card, right? You're looking down its thin edge and then it flips back down. So we're gonna have to somehow flip this over in 3D. It's not a 2D flip where the card is spinning like the matched emojis are. It's actually rotating towards us in space. And it turns out there is a really easy way to do that in Swift UI. You're finding out there's a lot of easy way to do common things. And we're going to do it in our Cardify because this is where we actually do the face up and face down business. It's going to have the Z stack that does the Cardify, the very top one here, have another effect. It's an animatable geometry effect called Rotation 3D effect. Now rotation 3D takes the angle, so this is how many degrees you want to rotate it. I'm going to rotate it by 180 degrees, but only if it's face down. So if it's face up, then I'm going to not rotate it. But if it's face down, then we're going to rotate it 180 degrees, right? If we did a full 360, it would spin all the way around again. It's hard to explain, but you'll when we do it, you'll see it. And then this axis here is which axis are we rotating on? We're rotating around the Y axis, which is this one, or the X axis, or the Z axis, which is pointing back out of the device at us. And of course, in this case, we're going to be rotating around the Y axis. This is the Y axis. Imagine kind of a uh, spine that goes through here. We're going to rotate around that spine. So this is X, Y, and Z. So this axis is zero, one, zero. That's no X vector. Y is full and zero in the Z vector. So hopefully this should rotate the card around, flip it around when it's face down. So let's take a look here. Oh, it, uh, well, Interesting. It definitely is flipping the card over. It's even got a little bit of perspective. You see how this side gets a little longer when it flips over. However, this is not really what a card flipping over looks like. You can see that even before the card is fully over, we can start to see the icon. It's backwards even. The emoji is backwards and it's flipping over and this is just not right. The way a card really flips is you see nothing, nothing. Now you start to see the image, right? Just red, just red. Now you start to see the image. So this is not quite working. What is happening here? <laughs> what is really going on? Because this is being animated via this explicit animation we're doing right here. We're choosing. That's why it's going so slow. It's three seconds here to flip this over. What is being animated in the choose? Well, choose is changing the model, causing some card to be face up, maybe some card to be matched, other cards possibly to flipping back down. So things are changing in the cards. 
and that's eventually causing this is face up in our view modifier to change. Now, when our is face up changes to is face up, these two views come on screen. They appear on screen, and they appear on screen in a Z stack here that was already on screen. So the appearance of these gets animated, either the appearance of this or the appearance of this. And then when you flip over to the other side, the disappearance of these or the disappearance of this is getting animated. So this fading in and out that you're seeing where the red is fading away right there, and this outer border actually is fading in, it's hard to see it, but it is. Those rectangles are happening here. This animation is happening because of transition animation. Remember we talked about transitions in the lecture slide. That's when views are coming or going inside of a container that's already on screen. So that's what's happening here. What about the emoji? When you click, see it fades, it's fading in. Well, that's this being animated. The emoji is always on this card. It just has opacity zero. But when I click this, now its opacity is one and it's being animated. So that's why these things are fading because the default transition animation, and we're gonna talk about transitions later, but the default transition animation when views appear on screen is to fade them in and the default to leave screen is also fading them out and this opacity right here. Plus this animation is happening. This rotation effect, it's going from zero to 180. And so over three seconds, we're seeing that rotation, that 3D rotation happen to the entire Z stack in this case is getting that, that animation. So this has helped us understand what's going on here but it's not really right. What do we really want to happen here? It's almost like we don't really want this, these two rectangles that make up the front of the card to appear when is face up is true. It's more like we want them to appear when it's at 90 degrees. Face down card is at 180 and we click it, it goes back to zero. So as it's going from 180 past 90, 90 and less, we want this showing. And on top of that, we don't want any fading in or out. When this gets to 90, we want that to be on there full blast, not faded in through some opacity. Plus, we never want this dark red to fade out like that. It stays full dark red until it gets to 90, and then it disappears. So that's a quite a different thing going on here. And there's no way to make these things do that with some, any kind of standard view modifiers, but that's okay because this is a view modifier. We have a view modifier right here. View modifiers are the things that do it does animations. This is a view modifier. This is a view modifier. We have our own view modifier. So we're gonna learn how to make our view modifier do this weird thing where it rotates around and when it gets to 90 degrees, it flips from one view to the other. Now, how the heck are we going to do that? Well, we know that we're gonna to have to track how much this is rotated because when it gets to 90, oh, we need to flip. So we're gonna to have to add a var called rotation, which is gonna be our rotation in degrees. And this is going to have to be the thing that drives all of what our user interface looks like. For example, is face up is not when we want this. This is always true when rotation is less than 90 degrees. If rotation is less than 90 degrees, then we should be showing the front because zero to 90 is the front and 90 to 180 is the back. Similarly down here, is face up. This opacity should be fully opaque whenever we're less than 90 degrees. In other words, we're face up. That's when this should be opaque, otherwise it should be transparent. And of course, the rotation itself should follow that rotation. Whatever rotation we're at, 70 degrees, 140 degrees, 90 degrees, 0, 180, this rotation 3D effect should be having the card be at that. So it's not really about face up. The animation of this card is really about how far we are 
through this rotation. Face up still exists as a concept, but it's no longer a bar. It's essentially just an init for people who are creating our view modifier. But all it's going to do is set the rotation if it's face up. We're going to set it to zero. Otherwise, we'll set it to 180. Flip over. So this feels the same to our users. This still works down here. And where we do the Cartify, that's it's still face up. But internally, we're worrying about the rotation because we need to know when we pass 90 so we can switch these views and also we can switch the opacity. So this is a good start, but it's not enough. If I run, nothing is actually going to change here. When I tap on a card, it's still doing the fade in, phase out, fade out thing. It didn't do any of this stuff. Now, the reason it's the same is that we have not, in fact, animated this degrees. So this degrees just gets set to 0, 180. It never animates through 90. So it's either 0 or 180. That's the only value this rotation ever has. We need to have this animate, meaning we need to have it start out at zero, let's say, and go to seven and then 12 and then 20 and then 25 and 31, kind of go through stepwise animation. And that's what animation is essentially, having variables that go from some starting point to some ending point along some curve, the ease in, ease out curve or linear curve, whatever it might be. That's what animation is. So we need to animate this. How are we going to get this animated? Well, we're going to do it by not being a view to modifier. We're going to be an animatable modifier. I'm going to go take a look at this protocol in the documentation. And there it is, protocol animatable modifier. It's both an animatable and a view modifier. So Cardify is still a view modifier but it's also now an animatable. Let's go pop in the documentation and take a look at animatable, what that is. It's a simple protocol animatable. It has one var called animatable data, which is of type self.animatable data. That's this associated type. Remember that protocols can have don't cares and we use associated type to make them be a don't care. By the way, when we see capital S self.animatable data, that means that things that are animatable are self-referencing, and therefore you can't use them as types. You can't have an array of animatable. You have to use them as where clauses, you know, where this don't care is animatable kind of a thing. But anyway, this associated type, this don't care animatable data that is our var, it is constrained right here. Remember constraints and gains? It's constrained to be vector arithmetic vector arithmetic here this vector arithmetic protocol is exactly what it sounds like being able to multiply and add together vectors and if you think about trying to animate something over a curve that's some vector arithmetic unless it's linear uh, you have to be able to multiply matrices essentially to calculate all the intermediate positions as you go from a start to an end so what kinds of things implement vector arithmetic? Well, one is double. If I look up double in the documentation and go down to the bottom, if you look up anything in the documentation, at the very bottom, it'll say which protocols it conforms to. And double <laughs> conforms to a lot of protocols, but one of them is vector arithmetic. Let's see, another one, CG float also does vector arithmetic, I believe. Yeah, there it is. And there are lots of other ones that do it. Probably one of the better ones is animatable pair. If you look at animatable pair, that does vector arithmetic. It just takes two things, a first thing and a second thing that do vector arithmetic and combines them. So that's how you can animate two doubles at once by using an animatable pair, which itself is a vector arithmetic. So that's how we do animation. We have to implement the var that's part of this animatable protocol. So let's do that. Var animatable data, it's called. 
By default, it uses an empty animatable data, but of course we don't want that. We want our animatable data to be a double, a double precision floating point number. It's this rotation right here. Now, we're using the rotation down here. We could, I guess, copy this and replace rotation everywhere with animatable data like this, but it doesn't make our code that readable here. Say animatable data is less than 90. It's like, oh, what was that animatable data again? Oh yeah, that's right, it was a rotation. So we don't usually just take the animatable data and pop it directly in there. We usually do a pretty cool trick, which is we make this into a get and set computed var, where we just get the animatable data we want, like rotation and we set a new value to that rotation. This is almost like just a rename of this, taking this rotation and returning it as the animatable uh, data and setting it uh, when it happens. So this is all that is required. We just have to tell SwiftUI what data in here do you want to animate and in our case it's this rotation. So now that we're animatable, it's not going to go in here and do this transition animation and animate the opacity. It's not even going to animate the rotation 3D effect. We're going to, because we're going to be called over and over and over with a new version of our animatable data. So if we're going from 0 to 180, it's going to get called 0, then you know, 6, and then 14, and then 23, and then 35. It's going to call this over and over, and that's perfect because when it passes 90, we'll switch our background. And our opacity will also get switched when we pass 90. So let's take a look. Woo, yes, look at that. So we click it, it's red, red, red. Oh, now it's the front. So by saying that we were an animatable modifier, we took over the responsibility to animate all this from the system. It's still back here, this explicit animation that is causing the animation to happen. It's just the Cardify, which is a view modifier, an animatable view modifier. It has said, I will animate this here. All you gotta do is animate my data for me and I'll figure out what I look like at each step in the animation. Okay, so we have seen a lot of animation here. We're only about halfway done, but so far we've seen implicit animations like our spinning train. We saw the different kinds of animation curves we can do, linear, ease in, is out. We, even, we didn't use it, but we saw a spring as well. We learned how to set the duration of an animation we added some view modifiers like rotation effect, scale effect, and rotation 3D effect. Those are all geometry effects, which SwiftUI knows how to animate. We also saw some geometry effects being done by the lazy V grid, like moving the cards around when we shuffle. We learned how to diagnose and fix animations that aren't happening because the view wasn't on screen when the view modifiers uh, arguments changed. We saw that with the is matched wasn't working on the second card. And we learned about the most common way to kick off an animation, which is explicit animations, that our intent functions are almost always explicitly animated. And finally, we learned how to create our own view modifier that does completely custom animation that might be completely different from any kind of other anim animation going on. So that's a lot of stuff so far. We got a lot more to go. The next thing we're going to talk about, and we've mentioned it a few times, is transitions. So this is the comings and goings of views, and that's something that can be animated as well in addition to view modifier argument changes being animated and also shapes can be animated. So the comings and goings of views as we learned in lecture is really just view modifiers. You're specifying view modifier for the coming of the view and then another set of view modifiers for the going. But most of the time when we're doing transitions, we're picking from some pre-canned ones. There's about four pre-canned transitions that we're going to use for most times that a view comes or goes. So let's run our app and I'll show you a place where we have a view that's definitely disappearing on us.
So let's go back to our game and speed our animation back up so we can click on choosing cards without having a really slow animation going there. Now to show you this transition, I need to find a match. So we're going to, have to play the game a little bit here. What was that a match? There it is. So we got a match. Now I'm going to click on another card and we're going to watch what happens to these two views. They're going to fade away. Watch this. See, they kind of faded out. That was a transition animation. They, these views transitioned to not being in the UI anymore. And so they went through a little transition animation. Let's go change that transition animation to something else so we can see how we can control it. Now, the view that's disappearing here is, of course, our card view that's in our game body. And adding a transition, very straightforward. We're just going to say dot transition. The argument here is usually going to be a static on the any transition struct. And this any transition is actually what's called a type erased transition. So transition is a type, but we almost never use it. We use these type erased versions of it. And I'm going to talk about type erasing in a future lecture, but for you, you don't have to worry about it too much. Just know that you go look up this struct, any transition in the documentation, you're going to see that it has some really useful statics. For example, any transition.scale. This transition means that the view zooms down until it's so small that it disappears, or if it's appearing, then it zooms out from nothingness up to the size of the view. So this is kind of a, a fun transition. Let's see this one in action. Again, I'm going to have to play the game, find a card here. Oh, a train. There's a train. Match. Now I'm going to click on a card here, and it's not going to fade out. They're going to kind of just disappear down to zero size. Watch this. Whoop. So that was kind of fun. That's actually, I think, a little nicer look than the fade out kind of animation. Let's see it again. Here we go. Yeah. And again, this uh, transitions can have their own animations that can control things like the duration. And you just put animation after here. We'll say animation dot ease in out with a duration of, we'll say two seconds so we can really see it happening. All right, playing the game again. I'm going to get good at this game by the time we're done with these lectures. I think there's, there we go, a taxi. And click. Slow two second scale out. So being able to control the animation that happens when views arrive and disappear from screen is really powerful because that's often happening. The place you most often see views coming and going is if thens inside of view builders. Right? If thens are choosing which views to include, whether it's here or over in our Cardify or whatever. And so views are coming and going a lot when you have if thens. Transitions are good for making that look smooth in the UI. Now these transitions, you also can specify the arriving animation differently from the going animation. So we do this with a kind of any transition called an asymmetric transition. It has an insertion, let's try scale for that, and a removal, let's say opacity for that one. So now when these cards arrive on screen, they should scale up. And when they disappear, they're back to fading out. Let's see this happening. Hmm. Oh no, these cards, they appeared on screen, but they didn't scale in. Let's see if that opacity is working. Yeah, the opacity is working, that faded out. Why did this not scale in? Well, this is our old problem again, where these views did not appear or disappear on screen from a container that was already on screen. This aspect vGrid came on screen with these cards already there. So they're not appearing on screen inside of a container that's already there. They appeared with their container. So it's the transition of this aspect vGrid that's going to control that appearance or disappearance because it's the thing that is appearing. And this shows a big difference between transitions 
and animations of view modifiers. Transitions can apply to dining room chair Legos, and they mean the entire dining room chair, its comings and goings. Whereas animation, when we apply it, implicit animation, if we apply it to a container, it distributes it out to any of the views inside. So that's quite a different feel there. But it makes sense, right? If you specify a transition for an aspect B grade, you're talking about the whole thing. And if you specify a transition for a card view, you just mean for that card view. So how could we make it so that when we first run our app like this, the cards scale in instead of just appearing with the aspect V grid? To do that, the aspect V grid has to come on screen first, and then after it's appeared, then these have to appear. And we often want to do that, where we want a container to get on screen first, and then after our containers appeared, then we want to have our views inside of it appear. There's a really cool way to do that, which is a view modifier that we use often on containers, but it can be used on any view called on appear. And it just takes a function and inside here, we can do anything we want when things appear. And really what I want to do here is essentially kind of deal the cards out into my UI. So how am I going to deal my cards though? I'm going to have to keep track of whether each card's card view has been dealt or has been put out into the aspect V grid. Now, where am I going to keep track of that information? I could keep it in my model, but it doesn't really belong in the model for my memorize game because it's not part of the memorize game to deal. Now that's different, for example, than your set game that you're working on in your homework. That does have the concept of dealing three new cards out. So dealing there might well be something you'd put in your model. A hint, hint for the next homework. But for the memorized game, it's not. It's just purely a UI thing to deal these cards out. So we get this nice scaling in animation that we want. So that's where things like at sign state come in. It's temporary information about the cards because they're only temporarily not dealt out here, and then quickly get dealt out, and then that state is really hardly even used after that. So at sign state is really good for that kind of UI control. So let's create a little at sign state here to do this. And remember that at sign state is only for use in my view. So we're always going to make our at sign states private. And I'm going to keep track of my cards by creating a little var called delt, which is going to be a set of the ints, which are the identifiers for my cards. Set is a new thing that hopefully you've read about in your reading, but it's similar to an array. It's just that you can't have the same thing twice in a set. An array could have the same thing in there many times, but a set makes sure that these things are unique uh, in there. And so things in a set have to be hashable. Luckily, we know that an int is hashable and it'll keep track of them for me. So as I deal my cards out, I'm just gonna throw the identifier for the card into this set, and that way I'll know whether a card has been dealt. Just a simple way to keep track of them. And it's gonna start out empty, which means none of my cards have been dealt, which is good, because then when my aspect V grid appears, all my cards will not yet have been dealt, and I'll be dealing them out. So I'm gonna create a couple of little functions to help me with this that use this dealt, one funk is called deal, and it takes a card, an emoji memory game dot card, and all this does is inserts that card into this set. So dealing a card just means put it in this set. I'm also going to have a little kind of is dealt function so I can tell whether the card has been dealt. Actually, I'm going to do is undealt because that's really what I need to know is whether it's not been dealt yet. Put the emoji memory game dot card here. It's just going to return a bool. And we're going to return uh, not dealt contains the card's ID. Contains is just a function on set that says whether the set contains that ID. So this is nice that our cards happen to have this nice unique identifier that we can use to keep track of whether they're dealt or not. 
Of course, I don't need this return right here because the one liner returns a bool, so we know about that. Now that I have these couple of primitives, I can easily deal my cards out down here and deal cards by just saying, with animation, go through all my cards, all the game's cards, and deal the card. And this is going to call this up here and insert it in here. So dealt is going to now contain all my cards. I have to do something about that though. When my aspect B grid first appeared, I have to make sure that none of my cards are in here. So I already don't show a card if it's matched and face down. I'm going to also not show a card if it is undealt or it's in this situation. So now my undealt cards are going to be not here. That's good because I want these to appear once they turn dealt. Dealing the card is going to cause this to change. This is not going to be in there anymore. It will transition out. It's clear so we won't see anything. And this one will transition in and we'll get our nice scale in. So this is a really simple way to use state right here to control the UI with this nice on appear. Let's take a look, see if it worked. Oop, our cards, they zoomed in like that. That was nice. We can see this even better. Let's go have this transition, have its animation again. We'll do ease in out with a duration of three seconds. Yeah, there it is. And hopefully our out also works. Oh, I missed it. There's an ambulance. All right, here we go. And it faded out over three seconds. So we really learned two things, three things at once there. One thing we learned about these transitions, having different ones for in and out. And we also learned about on appear, which is a great way to not put a view on screen until after its container appears. And we even learned a little bit how to use at sign state for real. This is not demo where this is for real temporary state in this view that's used to control just how the UI operates. So this UI looks great, but we really would like, instead of just having our cards zoom in at the beginning like this, is if we could deal them off of a deck. And that's more like a card game. So I'd like to create another view, which is my deck of cards, and then have the cards woo, deal out to fill up the screen here. I've already got this mechanism where I'm gonna deal my cards when my container appears. I don't have to do it in this kind of simple transition way. I can do it with a deck. So let's start that with a deck. I need some sort of deck and just like I have my game body here, I'm gonna create another var, which I'm gonna call my deck body. It's some view of course. And this is just going to be a Z stack of card views. I'm going to do for each my game's cards. Here I want to filter out for only the ones that is undealt. And we'll take each of the cards in that for each and create a card view for it. One thing when you're doing these functional programming things and you're passing along a little function here, this function is undealt. It itself is a function that takes a card and returns a Boolean. So we don't have to do this little curly brace here. We could actually just say filter is undealt. Because the argument to filter is a function that takes a card and tells you whether to include it. We have that function. We don't have to put it into curly braces here. This is probably a good opportunity to also show you how to fix the size of a view. My deck of cards, I really don't want it to scale and get larger or smaller because it's not the same as the cards in my game where if I have more cards, I want them to be smaller and fewer cards are bigger. I want my deck to be a fixed size. So let's take a look at the view modifier that lets you set things to be a fixed size. It's called dot frame. Now frame has a lot of arguments you can see here, min width, ideal width, max width, blah, blah, blah. But it also has just simple width and height. Notice it also has alignment. That's because this frame is really just going to create a space for this view, in this case, the Z stack. 
And if the Z stack does not choose to use all the space offered to it, remember how layout works, then this alignment will say where it appears at the top, left, right. Now our Z stack, of course, has card views. These things are all things that take all of the space offered to them, so we don't really need we don't need to specify any alignment here. So how about the width and the height? Now I've started to type some sort of constant here. I wanted to say, I don't know, 60 wide and maybe a height of 90, something like that. But really, we want to be better about doing constants from the start, even in these demos. So I created a little code snippet for my card. And these constants, I'll be using them the rest of these demos to set things. And I just wanted to emphasize that you should be doing this. You shouldn't be having these magic numbers up here. So I have one here for the undealt width and height. I'm going to go here and say my card constants dot undealt width and then my card constants dot undealt height. This will create a space on screen that's this size and our Z stack is going to fill that frame because this is a flexible Z stack full of flexible card views. We better also set the foreground color just like we set the foreground color on our game body to red. We should set the same thing for our deck body. But I'm not going to say foreground color dot red here. I don't want this red to be a constant in my code. So I'm going to change that to card constants dot color. Use that here. That way I'm never at risk of my deck being a different color than my game's body. And we can just pop this deck body into our top level UI here. I'll put it in the VStack to start anyway. And I'm also going to slow down this deal animation so we can really see what's going on here. And we can also remove this slowdown animation on the transition of our cards arriving here. But I'm going to leave this transition in here, this scale, so we can see that happening. And in fact, let's add a transition down to these card views down here so we can see them more clearly. But in these ones, we'll use the default for arrival. Although remember that these deck cards, they just appear. They don't actually transition on screen because their Z stack that they're in is always on screen from the start. We don't have this on appear going on with our deck body down there. But when they're removed, I'm going to have them scale. And these get removed when the deal happens because they get removed out of this for each right here. And that's another thing to consider when you're trying to find which of your views are arriving and departing so that you can set their transitions. We talked about that happening with if thens, like up in this view builder here, this if is undealt is what causes this to appear or disappear. But it can also happen with for eaches. You have this array right here, and this filter is causing it to change. When we deal the cards, this filter filters them all out eventually, and that makes these card views all disappear. So that's a second way, very common way, to see views appearing and disappearing is with four each. Let's take a look and see what we got here. Hopefully our scale animations will show us what's happening. There's our deck, and on a pier, it started to fade out, and these ones started to fade in. So we've made a good first step along the way of trying to make a deal animation happen here. Of course, it's really not quite what we want. And I can tell right away another thing that I want is I don't want it to do this deal as soon as I launch. I just want it to deal when I tap on the deck. So I'm going to go move this on up here that does the deal. Take that, pop it right down onto my deck body and have it be a tap gesture instead. We're doing exactly the same thing, dealing the cards. It's just I'm doing it when I tap on my deck, which is a little more user-friendly than having it do it automatically. Okay, here's my deck. Good. Tap. And we're dealing all the cards. All right, so dealing the cards really means that they fly out from the deck to where they're supposed to be. That's what dealing looks like. How do we do that? We have a perfect tool for that in SwiftUI. It's that match geometry effect we talk about. All we need to do is match the geometry of the cards in the deck 
to the cards out here. Then when they appear and disappear, they will match their geometry as then fly to the new location. So it's a perfect tool for this. Let's do that. It's going to go up here, start with our card views in our main body. I'm going to say matched geometry effect. And we need an ID for this view. Perfect ID available is the cards identifier. And we need to specify the namespace that this ID lives in right here. Because we could have multiple match geometry effect happening with completely different kinds of views. We can use this namespace. It's essentially just a token to provide meaning to what this int, in this case, is. And we're going to do this exact same match geometry effect down here on this card view. And this is what links these card views up to these ones. This namespace right here is just a token that we create using one of these property wrappers. It's called at sign namespace. It's always private because these namespaces are only used inside of our view. That's all it takes, actually, to do that. Now, one thing that you noticed I've done here is I went ahead and left these transitions in here because I just want to emphasize that these transitions can take effect. If you want, you can match the geometry and you can do the transition. That don't really make much sense here because we want the match geometry effect to cause the cards to fly up there. We really don't want them to be scaling or descaling or something as they're doing it, but we'll leave it on and see what we get. All right, we'll deal. Here we go, it's dealing out the cards, but oh, see, they shrank a little and then they went back out. So we actually have both effects going on here. Started to move the cards out, they shrank a little and then started to scale up. And again, the animation system is doing the best it can. You're really asking it to do two different things at once, but it doesn't ignore the transitions. So what transition do we really want on these? Well, for the dealing out of the cards, we really don't want any transition. We want the match geometry effect to be completely controlling the animation. And we can do that very easily up here by just either removing this transition. But I don't want to remove this transition entirely because I still want to go back to having, when my cards are matched, having them scale down. So when the cards go away, I still want them to scale down. So what do I put here then as my insertion animation? I'm going to use identity. Identity means don't scale it, don't opacity. It's, it's the don't do any animation, essentially, for this transition. It's exactly what I want. So I can still have it rely on the geometry effect when it's inserting one of these card views, and then still have it scale away when they match and go away. And we we'll want to do the same kind of thing down here. Uh, it doesn't really matter how these cards appear. Remember, I said before, uh, we could have that be whatever we want, but it's this removal that we want to affect. And again, I'll do identity so that when the cards are removed from the deck, they don't animate, they don't scale or fade or anything like that. Let's see if that fixes our animation here. Click on the deck. Ooh, perfect. All right, now <laughs> this is getting really close. That was a little bit of a muddy looking animation because all of our cards don't really have any distinction to them. They're just these red blobs. And so when they're overlapping each other and dealing out, it's kind of hard to see them. So let's do want something simple, which is let's have our cards all be face up, at least while we're working on this animation. It breaks our game because of course we can't click to match anymore, but we'll be able to see this animation better. Go over here, right here to our model and make my cards all be face up as I deal them. And we'll just be able to see the cards a little better here. All right, here's our card, tap, and dealing out. Okay, looks pretty good actually. But there's one last piece to being really like dealing, which is that we don't deal all the cards at the same time. Kind of deal them one at a time, you know, deal, 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 till we deal the whole set of cards. So how can we make it so that the deal happens one card at a time, essentially? The way to do that is we're going to delay 
the animations as we go. So we'll deal this card out, then we'll just wait a short amount of time, then we'll deal this one, then we'll delay the next animation a little bit, and then a little bit more. We'll just keep delaying each animation more and more until this last one, its animation doesn't even start until you know most of these other ones have, have been uh, animated already. This is really simple to do because animations can be delayed. You can specify what their delay is. I'm going to create a little function up here, a private func called deal animation. And it's going to take a particular card, oh, gee, memory game that card, and it's going to return the animation to use to deal that card. And mostly this is just going to be an animation that is normal ease in out with a certain duration. And I have a card constant for that, my deal duration. But the trick is we're going to have this animation be de delayed. It's going to be delayed by a certain amount. And this delay depends on which card. That's why we pass the card in here. So let's calculate that delay. It started out being the delay of zero, no delay. And now I got to find the index of this card because farther cards down the row of the indexes are going to be delayed more. So we're just going to say if let index, and we know how to get the index of a card out of a cards array from our previous lecture. So I'm going to do first index where, I'm just going to find the one where this guy's ID equals this card's ID. And if I can find the index, then I'm going to set my delay to be I have to make this all in doubles because we can't mix, this is an int, right? We can't mix the multiplication and addition, et cetera, of ints with doubles. So I need to convert this to a double. And remember, we do type conversion just by creating a new thing there. I'm going to multiply that times. I'm going to use a card constant here again, this total deal duration, I call it, which is the total time to deal. I'm going to divide that by the number of cards in my game. So we'll take the total time we want it to take to deal all the cards and divide it by how many cards we have. And that's how much we'll delay each card goes through. So I have this deal animation right here. How do I apply this to each card? Well, here's where I do the deal. And right now I'm animating all the cards being dealt at once. So instead, I'm going to move this four out here and do the with animation for each one using this deal animation for that card. So I just swapped it around. And yeah, this for loop is gonna happen very fast and it's gonna fire off 16 or however many cards there is animations and they're all gonna overlap and that's all perfectly fine. The animation system has no problem with issuing many animations all at the same time and all overlapping at the same time. Let's see what this does. And we have our cards here. I'm going to tap. Oh, deals them out very nicely there. I did see one minor thing I didn't like. Let's take a look at it again. When you watch these cards being dealt, it looks like they're being dealt from the back of the deck here. So this ambulance seems to stay on top. And then see the cards are kind of flying out the back of it. And that's really not kind of the way I want. I really want the cards to appear to deal off the top of the deck. So how can I control the order of the cards in the Z direction, we call it, the direction that comes out of the screen towards us? That's the Z direction. Because right now they're in this Z stack, so they're probably in the order that these cards got filtered out of here. But up in here, I've got an aspect V grid. It's just unclear what the order of these cards is, right? The aspect V grid puts them in order this way, but we don't really know what their order is front to back, you know, from the device out towards us. Well, when you have a situation like this, where you've got the cards and you want them to essentially be in some order towards the user, you can use a great little view modifier called Z index. I'm just going to put the same Z index on both of these card views. And that way, they'll, no matter which one they're in, they'll have the same Z ordering. So let's put it in here, Z index. I'll have a little function to calculate the Z index for a given card. 
And I definitely want to have this Z index business happening on both of the cards so that they're lined up as they deal out. So I'm going to calculate the Z index. Very simple here. We'll private funk Z index of card. G memory game dot card. It's going to return a double. So the Z index can be any double that you want. And the higher numbers will always be in the front and the lower numbers will be back towards the device itself in the Z direction. So in this case, I want the first card, the zero index to be in the front. So I'm going to do minus double of the index of the card, which again is game.cards.first index where and dollar zero dot ID equals the cards ID. And if we can't find it, I guess we'll just return zero, which means put the cards that we can't find in front. So this is that optional defaulting. Remember this returns an optional because it might not find the first index. And so we're going to default it to zero there. Let's see if that fixed our dealing from the bottom of the deck problem. All right, here we go. Deal. Oh, yeah, they're coming off the top. Very nice. Okay, let's turn our cards back down so we can actually play the game. Tap. Ooh, it actually looks okay with them face down now that we're dealing them delayed like that. And our game still plays. We can, oh, there's a match right there. And now when I click on another card, hopefully these will fade out because I have the removal transition for this card view still being scale. Oop, it worked. All right, there's two more things I want to do in our Memorize app. We've added so many different animation things. There's a couple more that'd be cool. One, I want to be able to restart the game. Okay, so this was in your homework, you had a new game. We didn't do it in lecture, but I'm going to do it now. Hopefully all of you have turned your homework by now, so you've already seen how to do it. It's pretty straightforward. And then the other thing, of course, is this little countdown timer right here it needs to be animated. So we got those two things. So let's add another button down here, new game or restart, I'm going to call it, that just restarts uh, this game. And that's easy to add. I'm going to pop over here, add another button, got shuffle. So I'm going to add another one called restart. It's some view, it's just a button, call it restart. Could call it new game, but we'll go with restart. And this one also gonna be animated. It's gonna need an intent function inside my view model. So we'll call it say game.restart. And also one thing about restarting, I'm going to set my delt set back to empty. A couple things about this. One is notice I can use array notation to set my set to something. And that's just kind of cool that if I put things in here, then they would be put in the set. But if I have this empty, then the set gets put back to empty. So that's kind of cool. And second, also know that when I change delt, delt is at sign state on my view. So changing delt by resetting this, that's going to cause animation to happen. It's going to cause re evaluating of our entire view because it's at sign state, just like changing something in our model causes it to be invalidated and rebuilt here. So same with at sign state. So this should undeal everything. Just setting this delt back to this should undeal everything. So we're, we're going to have to see that in action and see how that works. So we need this restart thing in our view model. It's just another intent, funk restart. Now restarting here, I'm just gonna create my model all over again. So I'm gonna call create memory game up here. Of course, it's a static. So its real name is emoji memory game dot create memory game. And recreating the model here, of course, is going to change this var and that's going to be published. And that's gonna cause all this stuff to ripple through and rebuild everything. Let's put this restart button with our shuffle button. How about we put it in a little H stack together? It's a spacer in between them. And I'm also gonna put a little bit of horizontal padding around them, keep them away from the edges a little bit more. Take a look at that. 
to get restart and shuffle. Tap, deals them out. Start playing our game. And hopefully restart undoes it. Look at that. And we still have the match geometry effect. So they flew back down here. That's pretty cool. Now notice that it delays on the way out, but when it restarts, it doesn't delay coming back in. And that's because down here, we're doing the deal animation on our tap gesture. We do all this stuff here. Whereas the animation that's happening when we do restart is happening here. So this is a different animation. It doesn't do each card and delays them. It's just setting the dealt back. And so all the cards just fly back normally with the match geometry effect. But I do see one problem here. It's maybe much more visible when I go into landscape mode. Look at this. All these cards are really small because it's leaving space for this right here. This guy, which is pretty big, it's even bigger than these cards right here. It's taking up space even when the cards are dealt, which is Never, we really never want that. This thing can never be on the screen at the same time, uh, same time as, as all the cards. So it's a wasted space right here. How am I going to deal with that? Well, anytime you have a view like this deck and some other view, like essentially our whole game, that are mutually exclusive, that's a great time to put them in a Z stack on top of each other. Because as one disappears, the other one will be showing and vice versa. So it's just instead of putting our deck body in the middle of our V stack. Let's take it out of here and put it in a Z stack with the rest of our game. This is the rest of our game right here. And run that, see what that looks like. All right, so here it is, it's Z stack of these two things. It's put it right in the middle of the screen still works to deal the cards out. They just deal from the middle of the screen. I'm not sure I really want it in the middle of the screen. I'd really like it more like down here. It'd be a nicer place to have it. So how can I put this thing down here? Well, of course, that's what we have alignment for. And so let's make alignment in our Z stack be, let's say the bottom edge. And for our deck. That means putting it down here. For the rest of our UI, it's a flexible UI, so it's going to fill the entire space. It doesn't really matter where it's aligned. We'll tap. Very nice. The cards are much bigger. They don't, they're not having to save space for the thing in here. And if I restart, it comes right back down to here. Okay. Last thing, let's get this pie animating. This pie needs to tick down when cards are face up. Now, to make this easier on us and so we can focus on the animation part of this, I've actually added a little bit of code to my model down here called bonus time. You'll be able to see this code. I'll post this code. So this code has some bars to keep track of the timing. But the main thing it has is start using bonus time and stop using bonus time. This starts and stops the bonus time that this card is using as it's being played. So we need to call these start and stop at the right time. And what we want to do is start using the bonus time anytime our card is face up and then stop using it when it goes face down or when we get a match. We get a match we also want to stop using bonus time so how we're going to do that we're actually going to use the thing we talked about a couple of lectures ago which is property observers i'm just going to add a property observer here to is face up remember the property observers are did set or will set and i'm going to do a did set here and whenever my card goes face up then i'm going to start using bonus time and if it goes face down, I'm going to stop using bonus time. So here's a way that inside my model, I can keep track of the timing here by using this property observer. And this ensures that there's no way that that car goes face up without us starting to use bonus time. And there's no way it goes back face down without us stopping it. And same thing with this matched. So when we set that, 
we want to make sure that we stop using bonus time. Once we've matched it, we don't want any bonus time being used up. So now that my model is properly starting and stopping bonus time, I can use some of the other things down here. Most notably, bonus remaining and bonus time remaining. Bonus remaining is the percentage of the bonus time allowed, bonus time limit here for this card. And bonus time remaining is the actual time interval, the number of seconds. Also has a really important VAR here, which we're going to use in our UI, which is, is consuming bonus time. That is whether or not we are actually consuming bonus time. And that's only if we're face up and not matched, and there's some bonus time left. So we're going to use this quite a bit in our UI. All right, so let's go back to the UI and make this work. Our first step is that we're going to have to make our pie shape. Let's get our pie code up here animatable. This is not currently animatable. Now shapes, just like view modifiers, can be animatable. And all we have to do to do that is do the same thing we did with view modifiers, which is add the animatable data that we want. Shapes are always assumed to be animatable. If we option click to see what the protocol shape is, you can see it always has animatable. So the same animatable protocol we implemented over here in Cardify, it's this one var. So let's just add the var right here, animatable data. And what do we want the animatable data of our shape to be? We want to animate both the start angle and the end angle of our pie so that, we, that thing can count down. So we have two things to animate here. We're going to do that by creating an animatable pair. And our animatable pair is going to be two doubles. So animatable pair is a generic type. So you have to specify it's two don't cares. It doesn't care which two things you animate. They just both have to be vector arithmetic, which doubles are. This double is going to be our angles here. And we'll do these just to be different, our angle in radians. And we'll do exactly the same thing we did with our Cardify. We'll use a get and set because we already have these two variables right here. And so this is just going to be essentially a rename of this pair of variables. So when we get here, we're just going to get an animatable pair that has the start angle as the first thing and has the end angle as the second thing we're animating. And exactly the same over here on the other side. We're going to set our start angle by getting an angle in radians that is this new values first item. Right? We're in the set of a computed property, so new value is the thing that our animatable data is being set to. And then the end angle equals angle dot radians new value dot second. So dot first and dot second are just bars in animatable pair that give you the first thing and the second thing in the animatable pair. And believe it or not, that's it. <laughs> that's all we need to do. Once we have provided what it is we want to animate, our path down here is just going to be, again, repeatedly called with our animated start angle and end angle, and that should redraw our path. So animating shapes, super simple pretty much the same process as we used to animate a view modifier over here. So now down here in our card view, this pie is animatable, could be animated. So let's make that happen. Let's start by just having the pie show our cards bonus remaining, which is the percentage remaining. So since it's a percentage and I want to do it with 360, but I want to go backwards. I'm going to do one minus the bonus remaining times 360. So this should make the pie show me how much time is remaining. Let's run and see how this works. And deal our cards out. Go in here. So it's full, it's not animating, but if I click away, Let's see if it actually kept track. It did. You see that? And then this guy, go back to him. He had just a sliver left. So it is actually keeping track. When I have a card, bring it down, bring it back, tick down a little bit, take it away, 
bring it back, it's ticked some more, take it away, bring it back, it's ticked down some more. So it is definitely counting the time. However, it's not animating in real time. We need it to be showing this moving in real time. Well, that turns out to be a little bit of a problem because nothing is changing in our model while this is counting down. Our model does not modify itself constantly, uh, less time, less time, less time. All our model does is keeps track of how much time has been used. If you ask it, it'll tell you, oh yeah, you've used six seconds or you've used four seconds, but it's not constantly changing and telling, you know, updating itself to be, oh, it's you know, 2.7, 2.6 seconds, 2.5. No, it doesn't do that. It's just query. We just ask it how much time is left. So how do you animate something that's not changing? This is a really interesting part of animation. We know one of the golden rules is we can only animate changes, things that have changed. And what's more, really, we're going to try and animate something in the future. Because when this card first comes up, it's got whatever time it's got left. And what we really want to animate, is it going to zero? Well, it's going to go to zero in the future sometime. So that's another breaking of the golden rule, which is that animations are showing you things that have already happened. So how is it possible to animate something in the future? And the answer to all that is we're just gonna create some at sign state inside of our card view, which is that future. And then we will animate to that future. So it's just simple as saying we want at sign state, which is always private var and i'm going to call this my animated bonus remaining and it's a double and it's going to be zero to start so i'm going to have my pi instead of showing the bonus remaining here i wanted to show the animated bonus remaining however i only want to show the animated bonus remaining if it's actually consuming bonus time remember over here we had this is consuming bonus time only if that's true do I want to be showing this animated bonus time. Otherwise, I want to be showing the time that was used, the current bonus remaining. So I have a little bit of an if I have to do here. If the card is consuming bonus time, then I'm going to do one thing. Otherwise, I'm going to do the other. So what are the two things? Well, if it's consuming bonus time, then I want to be using my animated bonus remaining right here, which is really going to be the future. Otherwise, it's going to be this. Now, I want the padding and opacity on both of these. So I could just cut it from here and paste it here and also paste it here. But that's kind of gross because now every time I want to change the padding, if I say, yeah, I want seven here. Yeah, now, yes, I could have a drawing constant for this. I should anyway. But there's another way to do this. If you have an if right here and you want to put something on both, you can put it in another sort of view combiner called a group. So a group is kind of cool in that it's really just a view builder. So it can have ifs in here, but you can use it to put other things around the outside. So these things are going to apply inside here. So this is just a convenient way to group things up and put the same view modifiers on all of them. Now we're almost there, except for that animated bonus time starts at zero. It's just always zero. Okay? So animated bonus time is always going to be zero here. So when we're consuming bonus time, it's not going to actually be doing anything. We need to kick off this animation. We need to start that pi animating down towards zero. And where are we going to do that? We're going to do that every time this pi appears on screen. Because this pi and this pi are going to be swapping places on screen depending on whether the bonus time is being consumed or not. So again, we could use on appear here. When this pi appears, we can start this animation going. So let's do that with animation. What is the animation? We want to animate the animated bonus remaining going to zero. This is what we're doing. This is how we're going to animate into the future by animating this going to zero. But of course, it needs to start. The animation needs to start at whatever the card's current bonus 
remaining is. So we'll start it at the current one and then animate it going to zero. So this is how we do it. Now this animation needs to take exactly however much time is left in the card's bonus time. So here we're gonna say dot linear duration card dot bonus time remaining. And voila, every time this pie appears, we will reset to whatever bonus is remaining and then animate it going to zero. And this will all work out nicely once the bonus time is all consumed, even if the card goes face down and comes back face up, well then it'll be using this pie because it won't be consuming bonus time at that point. So let's take a look, see if this animation kicks off successfully. Peel our cards out. Click on a card. Oh, look at that. It's working. Click over here and let's click away. And when we click away, that animation is going to stop because it's not consuming bonus time uh, anymore there. And when we go back, it continues because on appear, it causes this pie to come back. Same thing here. Click on this. This pie comes back. So this pie reappears every time we flip it back face up because is consuming bonus time starts up again. So we keep switching back between these two pies. So this is kind of a tricky use of on appear, but in a way it makes sense conceptually because every time this pie appears on screen, we want to start animation. That is the trigger to start this animation. We just got to make sure we start it at the right time, and that the animation is going to take the right amount of time. And it's always heading towards zero remaining, of course. So phew. We learned an awful lot about animation in this uh, lecture. Let's take a look at what we got. We've got our match geometry effect coming up here. We've got our card flipping, our special view modifier. We obviously have our animation of our shape right there. Let's see if we can find ourselves a match. There we go. We've got our implicit animation that spin this thing around here. We had our shuffle, which is our explicit animation. Of course, we do explicit animation also when we choose a card. We learned how to kick off animations when things appear, like this one right here. We also learned how to delay animations. That's how we got this delayed dealing. We learned how to diagnose problems when we had an animation not happening that we were expecting. If we can find a match here. Oh, this is terrible. I'm playing the game awfully right here. Oh, there we that this one. Oh, this one and this one. Uh, we had the problem where one card would spin and the other didn't. And we realized that was because this little text was coming on and off screen as part of an if then. So we just made it always be on screen and used opacity to hide it when we didn't want it there. We learned a lot of geometry effects, rotation, scale, rotation 3D, and we learned that there are geometry effects happening behind the scenes, like our lazy V grid here is obviously positioning all these cards, and that's why when we do shuffle, we get this nice animation as well. So a lot learned there. This is the kind of thing where I'm not going to expect you to have mastered all these animation uh, tricks here. Uh, homework assignment is to add animation to your assignment three. But we're going to do some things like we'll do this match geometry effect. And I want you to be doing some animations uh, sort of like we did with the rotating car or something similar. And I'm going to give you a lot of freedom to choose what kind of animation you want to do so that you can pick and choose from what you've learned here to, and apply it to inside your homework. So that's it for this week. Next week, we will be going away from Memorize and starting a completely new app, which we'll stay with for a few weeks. And we'll come back to Memorize with our very last assignment of the quarter, Assignment 6. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.